Am I on? Hello, and um, welcome to the Greener Communities Speaker Panel. I'm Jen Reedsma, Community Coordinator with the Alger Heights, um, Alger Garfield Neighbors Collaborative. And this event was a result of some listening that we, uh, the collaborative did back in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we found that neighbors were interested in learning more about um, ecologically minded practices. And so this event was actually scheduled for March of 2020. <laughs> And obviously, COVID postponed that until now. And so thanks for joining us on this live event. Um, so tonight, you're going to learn more about native plants, environmental justice, composting, and the community collaborative on climate change. Um, each speaker will have about 20 minutes to talk about their area of um, expertise. And then we'll open it up to questions. So make sure that you put your questions in the chat feature of YouTube Live, or you can email them to the email address that is on the YouTube Live um, page. Uh, I want to thank the Croc Center for hosting us tonight and for um, John Chainer and Matt Aho for being our um, YouTube Live experts back up in the booth. And then um, I just want to take a moment. I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I hope that this is a great um, night for you guys to learn some a lot about um, environmental um, not just not just justice, but different aspects of um, le le leaving, living a greener life. Um, so first, we're going to have each of the panelists answer the following question. What impacts can residents have on their environment and neighborhood by using the information they will hear tonight? So Sarah Dason is um, from Auntie's House, and she will be up here um, later on talking about the community collaboration on climate change. So come on up. Um, I want to say uh, thank you for hosting us um, tonight on such an important topic and oftentimes goes um, unannounced, you know, in our environmental um, circumstances and especially in our communities. Um, I come representing an Indigenous voice here tonight to kind of talk about the stewardship um, that we impact on our community, especially in Grand Rapids, where we have such a high um, indigenous um, voice there. And so to kind of talk about the relation of the question, um, you know, we use that term kind of call to action, but there's also, you know, the engagement piece that comes with environmental justice to kind of um, get involved in your communities to really know your leaders, know what's going on in um, the background of what's happening, to get your family involved, to look at type of, uh, you know, sustainability activities or recyclable activities that go on and to follow those types of leaderships um, that are taking place in your communities and to get involved. You know, it's fun. Um, it's fun to know that knowledge. It's fun to be caretakers of the land. Um, you know, to teach that science and that relationship to our young people. Um, so I don't want to take too much time to leave it up to the other panelists that um, share the space tonight. Um, but yeah, follow us, follow, you know, the education systems that lead those activities. Um, follow the cleanup groups that are out there. You know, um, John Ball Zoo has one coming up, you know, in the uh, west side over there in the neighborhoods. So just um, take action. You know, take care, take care of one another, be good stewards. Um, and we'll talk about more about what Grand Rapids and stuff is um, doing with those relationships. So thank you for your time tonight. Miigwech. All right, so Greg, am I on? Greg is going to come up and um, he's from Urban Roots. I'm sure many of you know about Urban Roots and their composting program. So he's gonna answer that same question that Sarah just did. Hello and good evening. My name is Greg Minkowski. I'm the compost manager at Urban Roots. I have uh, had the pleasure for the last three years to coordinate this program on a community scale. And I encourage you, after reviewing this presentation, to take up the action at home right away and you can start tomorrow. 
um, the impact you can directly have on your neighborhood is simply starting to divert organic materials from the landfill. In the landfill, those organic materials, do, they break down in the absence of oxygen and produce methane, a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Composting is one really easy, low impact way you can be involved on a small scale, community scale, neighborhood scale, and yield a byproduct that is high quality compost amendment for your garden or to distribute at a, at a different site. Um, you don't have to subscribe to a service. You can simply start collecting food, decide on an area behind your house where that compost bin will go, whether you purchase it or you build it yourself, and you start filling it in. Go to the library, do a little bit of preliminary research, or reach out to us at Urban Roots, and we can help guide you in those first steps of becoming a little more um, independent with your uh, management strategies regarding organic materials. All right, next up we have Kyle Meyerich Skop. And um, he is from the environment, Evangelical Environmental Network, and he's going to be talking later about environmental justice. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and thanks to all of you for tuning in tonight. i um, honored to share this space with uh, such terrific leaders in the community. Um, the question, what impact might people have from what they're learning here tonight? Uh, I hope that you might learn one or two things that you didn't know before tuning in tonight. Uh, one or two things about this community, specifically one or two things about the ways in which we live together in community and the ways in which our society is structured that disproportionately harms our neighbors and in many cases ourselves by the ways that we choose to interact with our environment. But not just learn about those injustices, but be empowered with tools to do something about it. Um, so uh, there are a whole menu of options, um, of steps that we can take to pursue greater environmental justice in our neighborhood that range all the way from deep, long-term policy engagement to really easy, fun, in my experience, joyful, personal changes that we can make at home all with a view toward orienting our community and our lives toward greater love and respect and dignity for one another. Okay, so our final um, panelist tonight is Warren Zimostrad, and he is a steward specialist at, with the Gun Lake Tribe, and he will be talking about native plants. So he's gonna come up, answer the question, and go right into his presentation. Okay, thanks, Jen. And uh, again, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in tonight. Appreciate uh, the time to speak with you. So I think um, we'll probably go in a lot, a lot more in depth here um, through my talk, but the impacts that you can have um, as a, a neighbor and a, and a steward of the environment are, um, there's, a, there's quite a few of them. And first off, I think native plants just look pretty, and so you'll make your neighborhood look prettier which is always a good thing. Um, but but uh, native plants also help uh, control stormwater and runoff. And we live very close to one of the most polluted uh, rivers, or excuse me, tributaries of uh, the Grand River as well, and then which leads out to Lake Michigan. So we can help to divert some of the nutrients and pollutants that might um, get rushed off into Placer Creek. Um, and then also native plants are just a real, real um, benefit to a variety of different types of wildlife. So by, by choosing native plants for your yard, uh, you're, you're doing a great service to uh, a bunch of little critters from birds, small mammals, insects, pollinators, all sorts of different, uh, different species. <clears throat> so with that, I will um, go into my talk tonight. Um, again, my name is Warren Zimostrad, and uh, I'm the stewardship specialist with the Gun Lake Tribe. 
Uh, there I, I manage land for, for the tribe. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the Muskegon Conservation District. And so I've planted a, a, a ton of, of native plants in my life. Um, I have a, a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Grand Valley. And I, you know, my focus with my, my role is that I like to restore native prairies for uh, birds and pollinators. And I've also been a, a six year resident of Garfield Park. And that's me and my wife there uh, planting jack pine trees up in Northern Michigan. So uh, what are native plants? Um, on the right there, you'll see my, my favorite native plant, Rattlesnake Master. Um, not only has a cool name, but it looks really neat when, you, uh, when it's uh, fully sprung out in its foliage. Um, but native plants are those that occur naturally in, in the region where the, in which they evolved. And um, these plants have been around for, for countless years prior to when even humans were in the area. And they are uh, found in every type of habitat. So regardless of where you go in the, in the world, you're going to find native plants. And uh, native plants are beneficial because they've co-evolved with birds and insects and bats and all the uh, critters that we'll talk about um, so that they work together to um, to benefit each other, and we'll talk. We'll talk a little bit about that um, more as we go. Um, so, the native plants are very beneficial to the environment. Um, there, you we see benefits with wildlife, with our water resources, uh, in in the soil, as well as uh, with climate. Um, so, yeah, now I'll go in a little bit more in depth about the benefit of native plants to the, the different areas. Um, so, like I said, numerous species uh, benefit from native plants. So, birds eat the nectar um, from the plants that the plants provide, as well as the seeds that uh, the plants grow. And that uh, hummingbird there on the right is taken a nectar sip off a cardinal flower. And that's one of the um, kind of examples of the coevolution. The, the nectar deposit in that flower is right at the tip of the, the um, hummingbird's tongue so that it can reach that, but no other, no other types of, uh, of uh, um, animals will, will get that deep into the flower. So, they kind of work together to um, benefit each other. We also see uh, a benefit with insects. Uh, they'll, they'll pollinate the different plants as well as they, they take nectar off of plants. Um, small mammals will live, live in prairies and large mammals, not that we have any around here, but large mammals find food in the prairie. Um, snakes use uh, native plants to um, to live to find uh, housing, and then bats also will eat the nectar from um, the native plants. And when we when we have a prairie ecosystem, which is native plants on a very large scale, it's a very complex ecosystem. Um, but on the bottom line, regardless of how many plants that you plant, uh, it's it's beneficial because without native plants, the wildlife that is native to our area will suffer. So another area um, that we see a benefit with planting natives is with our water resources. And uh, since nati native plants are adapted to the area that they um, evolved in, they're, they're more drought tolerant. And uh, native plants require four times less water than your lawn would because the grasses that we use in our lawn are not, not native to our area. Um, our native plants have extremely deep roots and they can use storm water, which is the water that um, comes off of rain events or any precipitation that we would have. And they can use that more effectively, which in turn causes less runoff into our water bodies like Plaster Creek 
and those deep roots also can trap pollutants and nutrients a little more effectively. So that uh, picture there on the left is a uh, is kind of a diagram of a what's called a rain garden, and it just kind of shows you how a rain garden benefits the environment by those the plants that are planted in that rain garden trap the water coming off your downspouts or on your lawn, and they hold that in there and use it um, more effectively than if you didn't have it there. And if you uh, go around Alger Heights or Garfield Park, you'll see a bunch of rain gardens that have been installed by uh, Kelvin. And they're super beautiful, so if you want to see some more native plants in depth, I suggest that you take a walk in probably July or any time in the summer just to take, uh, take in the beauty of, of our native plants. So again, uh, we talk about this, the soil and um, the benefit of native plants to the soil is that the, the deep roots that I talked about on the previous slide hold uh, the soil a lot better than, the, than shorter roots do. And this allows to trap sediment that might run off from the stormwater into our water bodies. And you can see on that, in that graph there on the, the right-hand side, uh, a um, comparison of the root structures for non-native plants versus native plants. And the non-native plants are a lot of the landscape plants that you might see in a normal, at, an, at a house, whereas the natives are maybe some, maybe some names you're familiar with, but um, definitely um, some less used plants in our landscaping. So the uh, common nine bark there on the left, I think it reaches down to almost 16 feet, which is ridiculous. But um, having all that, the, that root structure in, in the soil traps that soil and, and um, keeps it from heading into our water bodies. And um, having the, the plants as a ground cover also keeps the soil in place uh, from wind. So you'll see it a lot of times that um, you plant any sort of ground cover in a bare area just to, to, to control that, uh, that sediment. And then uh, native plants are also great for um, when we think about the climate, they're very low maintenance once they're established and they, you don't have to mow them as much as you would a traditional lawn, so you're using, a, using less gas or electricity to uh, run your lawnmower and uh, not giving off any uh, gases, greenhouse gases. They also uh, trap carbon in greenhouse gases a little more effectively than, than a non-native plant would. So we are looking to native plants to help control the rising temperatures in our climate, and we are doing so because all the, these benefits that they have. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about how you would go uh, about planting natives at, at your home or uh, anywhere. Uh, so planting natives do, does take a little work because uh, a lot of the weeds and the non-native plants that we have in our area are now more abundant. They actually outcompete native plants, and so we have to do a little more uh, work so that we can ensure that they will um, establish themselves. So the, the first thing you'd want to do is uh, get to know the site that you're intending to plant your native plants, and you want to know if it's a sunny or shady site, whether the soil is, is wet or if it's pretty dry or if it's a rocky soil or a clay soil, all that will help you decide on, on which plants that you would want to plant at, in your area. And um, once you've chosen the site that you want and you've kind of taken all your um, data on its characteristics, you'll start preparing the site. And, and there's, you, there's a few ways to do that. And you want to do that so that you remove any of the, um, the plants that have uh, grown there at currently so that you can have more or less like a blank slate for when you um, start planting. 
So you can do that by mowing. You could do that by herbicide. Not, not the most uh, environmentally friendly, but that is definitely effective. You can till up the area, and then you could also do a thing called smothering, which is that picture there on the right where you put a tarp down and just let the, let the uh, weeds die underneath it because they're not getting any sunlight. So next, after you've got your site prepared and while you're waiting for all the weeds to die and whatnot, you want to uh, choose the plants that you're going to use to uh, beautify your yard. And so you would want to um, look at the characteristics of the plant and determine whether or not it grows well in a shady or a sunny area or uh, a wet or dry area. You also want to make sure that you have different bloom times so that the pollinators can have um, a nectar resource throughout the summer. And you want to probably have a few different colors because different pollinators are attracted to different colors. And then lastly, um, you'd want to have a variety of heights for your plants because benef uh, the beneficial insects and pollinators all feed at different levels in, of the plants. And so generally, you, plant two diff you can plant two different types of plants. You could plant a plug, which is that, that graphic on the right there. Those are called plugs. And those are plants that have already been started for you in a greenhouse. And you would want to plant those in the springtime. Or you could plant the plants by seed, which is like you would a garden or whatnot. Um, and you would do so in the fall with the seeds. If you choose to plant plugs, uh, they should be planted about six inches apart from each other. And if you decide to use seed, the seed will come with directions on how much of it you need to plant per square foot or per acre. But you want to make sure you add a, a nurse crop, which is uh, a cheaper seed such as oats or rye. And what that'll do will help um, outcompete the weeds, seeds that might try to come back once you're um, waiting for your seeds to uh, fully mature and your, your plants to grow. So now that you have your uh, seeds planted and your plants are growing all nice and pretty, you do have to do a little maintenance. Like I said before, uh, native plants require a lot less maintenance than a traditional lawn or plant would, but there are some things you need to do to ensure that they grow healthy. healthy. Um, so if you, if you decide to plant your plugs, you would want to mow that in the second year. If you decide to plant seeds, you'll want to mow that the summer after you plant them. And you'll want to do that a couple times. And what that does is allows um, you to chop the weed uh, plants up before, they're before they can drop their seeds which um, would just grow back the next year. So you're kind of cutting those weeds off before they're allowed to, um, to reproduce. And then, like I said earlier, once, once your uh, native plants are fully established, you'll, you don't even need to mow them every year. You can do so every uh, two to three years. And, um, and like I said, that, that'll um, reduce the amount of work that you have to do. So um, to help you choose some of your plants, I thought we'd talk about a, a few different varieties. So our sunny plants are um, those plants that require more than six hours of sun per day. These are the most, um, uh, I, I guess, the most common on, on, in a prairie landscape because those are um, wide open. But a few of those like uh, would include the compass plant, Hori vervane, lead plant, which is there on the right, uh, marsh or meadow blazing star, rattlesnake master, which is again my favorite plant, and then sand coreopsis. And this is just a uh, very very small list of of the of the sunny plants. Uh, the um, next next uh, category of plant would be then partial or shade, partially shady plants. And they don't need full sun, 
but they need about four to six hours of sun each day, so moderately um, sunny area. And you'll find the most, most of these, um, this type, be, they're the most common. Um, so some include black-eyed Susan, butterfly weed, common bone set, little blue stem, which is that grass there on the, on the right. It's really pretty and it changes colors throughout the growing season. So I, I really uh, like that on the landscape. Uh, prairie dock and then wild lupine. And then lastly, if you have a very shady area, those um, again have less demands for sun, but are also less common. So a few of those include uh, bottle brush grass, Christmas fern, Harry Penstemon, Jack in the Pulpit there on the right, white trillium and wild columbine. And if you wanna see some, a ton of white trillium, you can take a trip out to uh, Amon Park and uh, it's just littered with that. So uh, I, I suggest that uh, this, this late spring here. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, in order to uh, find, find your native plants, you're gonna have to do a little work uh, they're not super common at a lot of uh, general nurseries, but um, there are areas that you can you can get resources for um, your native plants. So there are a few um, groups in the area that host uh, native plant sales. The uh, first one being the Kent Conservation District. Their plant sale is on the on May 22nd of this year, and um, they're actually. Uh, taking pre-orders right now, so if you're if you're uh, all gung ho about this, you can uh, can uh, order through them. And they're also hosting a talk tomorrow night about native plants. So if you're really really gung ho about this and want to hear more about it, they they have a, a a Zoom talk tomorrow. You can find that information if you just Google them. Um, and then we have a, a, a chapter of the wild ones, so the River City Wild Ones, that's a local group of native plant connoisseurs. They have a native plant sale on um, July 19th. And then we, there's a nursery called Wild Type Nursery that grows native plants. So these are all areas that you, you could buy plugs if you're interested. If you wanted to uh, grow your plants by seed, there's a few, um, vendors there, the Michigan Wildflower Farm and the Native Connections. You could also go to your the greenhouse that you prefer to go to and um, ask them if they could start carrying natives and see what kind of luck you get with that. But, uh, it, you know, once, if you're really interested in, in native plants, it's best to visit some native gardens to see what you like and um, then make your decisions from there. So. Again, take a walk around the uh, Alger Garfield area and look at those rain gardens. Uh, Calvin College has a, Calvin University has a, a really nice native garden. And, um, and there's, a, there's a few others, um, any of the properties that are owned by the uh, Land Conservancy of West Michigan would have a lot of native plants too on them. So with that, do we have any questions? Okay, so you said the rattlesnake master was your favorite native plant, but I'm curious, what are what like groups of plantings do you enjoy putting together of the ones you've listed? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I I really like the to plant the milkweed species, their uh, group. So there's a, a, a few different types of milkweeds and they all kind of look different. But one, one benefit of milkweed is that uh, the monarch butterflies really enjoy milkweed. They, their whole life cycle is, is, is done on the milkweed plant. So their eggs hatch off the leaves and then the caterpillars eat the, the leaves. And then once it emerges into an adult, then it takes nectar off the, the milkweed plant. So how do we get over the idea that a lawn has to be mostly grass, right? That's a big hurdle. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, I think, the main, the main concern or the main, 
I guess, concern with a lot of homeowners that they, they've grown up or they've seen all their, uh, all their neighbors have these really nice manicured lawns. And so I think the, the way to do it is to, to get out there and look at your native plants, visit the rain gardens, visit um, the different areas and, and see the beauty that we have in them. And, and just know that all these benefits that we, we get from native plants are um, only going to be uh, added to by you planting them in your yard. Um, are there any landscapers out there that specifically like, are geared towards native plants versus your traditional landscaping? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I can't name any off name. I just actually, I was on uh, Calvin University. Uh, they have a, uh, a uh, group called the Plaster Creek Stewards. And I was just on their website last week. And they mentioned a, a native landscaper in the, on their website. So if, you, if you're, you're looking for one, there's at least one on, on the website. Right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you so much, Warren. Yes, my pleasure. Thank All right. you. So Kyle's coming up next to talk about environmental justice. Great. Thanks, Jen. Thank you, Warren. That's terrific. Is it okay if I hold this mic? Can I take it out and hold it? Okay. Thanks. I like to wander. Um, I'm also going to set a timer because I'm a trained preacher and going over time is an occupational hazard. So I'm going to try to keep myself honest here. Uh, well, thanks again, Jen, for the invitation. Um, and it's, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Kyle meyerd -Skop. I'm the vice president of the Evangelical Environmental Network, which is a, a national group of Christians across the country who are trying to put our faith into action by caring for God's creation uh, and addressing the moral threat of climate change. Um, I have been with the Evangelical Environmental Network for about five years now. Most of that time was spent as the national organizer and spokesperson for their youth engagement arm, which is called Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. I transitioned into my new role uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, I'm also a, a neighbor. I live on College by Hoyt up in Garfield Park neighborhood. Uh, we just celebrated three years in that house, uh, and we love being a part of the neighborhood. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about environmental justice. And at the outset, I want to name a problem with my presentation. And that is that I am a white middle class man talking about environmental justice. And that's a problem because the environmental justice movement is led by black, indigenous, people of color, many of them women, many of them poor. I want to name the fact that I am not a part of those groups. I think that's a problem. So I am here tonight to introduce what environmental justice is, to share a few examples of environmental justice in our community, and then as quickly as possible direct you to the groups that are doing the on-the-ground, day-in, day-out work in our community to achieve environmental justice, because those are the leaders who are doing the work, and they are the folks that need our support. So I just wanted to name that at the outset because I think it was important. So uh, to start, I, I just want to ground us in what environmental justice is. So the, the Environmental Protection Agency actually has a definition. They say that environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Very jargony, as you would expect from the Environmental Protection Agency. But basically, the environmental justice movement is a grassroots movement that sprang up to address a statistical fact, which is this that black, indigenous, people of color, and those who are poor are disproportionately and intentionally exposed to pollution 
in the United States. Disproportionately, because the data bears this out, there's mountains of it, it's impossible to refute that. Intentionally, because policies in the United States, many policies in the United States, have been developed with the intent of shielding certain populations from harmful environmental impacts and exposing other populations to them. Because if you're going to shield some folks, you have to expose other folks. Uh, this has been done through housing and zoning laws. Uh, the book The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein does a great job explaining how housing discrimination and zoning laws have made sure that the people who live next to polluting industries and toxic waste sites and next to interstates are disproportionately black, indigenous, people of color, and poor folks. Um, so uh, I just want to make sure that we're all aware of this fact. This, this, these realities have not happened accidentally. They are the result of intentional policy choices. Uh, the environmental justice movement demands that communities have economic and political power over their own health and safety. Seems pretty simple, but it's anything but because the status quo is entrenched and the people who benefit from the status quo have a lot of economic and a lot of political power. And so people leading the environmental justice movement are demanding that they be given back their economic independence and uh, the political power that is rightly theirs to make decisions over how they as a community are impacted. And environmental justice ensures that all people, regardless of wealth, race, or zip code, have equal protection from environmental harm. The environmental justice movement simply demands that government do what government's supposed to do, which is protect its citizens from harm. So are we just talking about communities out there, or does this happen here? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that there are plenty of examples of environmental injustice right here in our own communities in Garfield Park and Alger Heights neighborhood. Um, I, I just want to draw your attention to three tonight. Um, the first one is air pollution. Uh, many folks might go about their days not thinking about air pollution as a particular threat to themselves or their families, unless um, they or someone they love has asthma or another respiratory illness. But uh, air pollution is actually a very, very grave threat to ourselves and our neighbors right here in our neighborhood. A recent study from the University of Michigan found that five of the top 10 census tracts for environmental injustice, airborne environmental injustice in Michigan, are in Kent County. Five of the top 10. So what this study did is it took environmental considerations like exposure to diesel soot uh, and PM 2.5 soot, which is really fine particulate matter that gets thrown into the air by tailpipes and through uh, smokestacks from power plants and lodges deep into our lungs. Those environmental factors, and it looked at social uh, risk factors like the poverty level. It combined those environmental and social risk factors, 11 of those together, to create a, an environmental injustice score. Five of the top 10 census tracts uh, for that score are in Kent County, and four of those five are inside of or border Garfield Park. And again, this is coming from things like diesel soot, PM 2.5 pollution. Uh, here's what that looks like. So you'll see that the census tracts, the top five census tracts that I discussed are highlighted, 26, 39, 36, 38, 40. That green border is the rough border of Garfield Park neighborhood. And you can see already that 38 and 40, census track 38 and 40, are mostly inside of Garfield Park neighborhood. They straddle US 131, which is that red line running top to bottom. But most of it is in Garfield Park. And then you can see 39 and 36 border Garfield Park. And even 26 is adjacent to Garfield Park, right? So each of these census tracks touch Garfield Park in some way way. We're talking about ourselves. We're talking about our neighbors when we talk about these census tracts that are the highest 
scores for environmental injustice in Michigan. And again, I just want to draw your attention to that red line that ran top to bottom. That was US 131, talking about how proximity to that kind of infrastructure, how even our transportation, the way we get from point A to point B, impacts ourselves and our neighbors. So air pollution uh, it is a big threat to health and well-being here in our community, and its impacts are felt disproportionately, right? That environmental justice score was an aggregate both of exposure to environmental threats and social factors. So folks who are already socially vulnerable are disproportionately exposed to those environmental hazards. Uh, the second environmental injustice I want to talk about in our community is lead poisoning. Uh, lead poisoning in the 49507 zip code, which is included in Garfield Park and is actually my zip code, is the fourth worst zip code for lead poisoning in Michigan. It is the leading zip code in Grand Rapids, and more kids in 2016 were poisoned by lead here in the 49507 zip code than during the entire Flint water crisis. That was just in 2016. And this is happening every single year. We say kids for a couple reasons. Kids are uh, especially vulnerable to lead poisoning because lead is a neurotoxin and it harms the body's ability to develop, the brain's ability to develop. Uh, early exposure has lifelong impacts. And a lot of this lead exposure isn't coming from water, right? We, we who followed the Flint water crisis recognize how lead can leach through water pipes. That's not really how it's happening here. It's mostly coming from lead paint. Uh, most of it is coming from old housing stock that is poorly maintained. Many of it uh, is rented, so landlords have very little incentive to maintain the property. Many of the tenants uh, have very little economic or political power to hold their landlords to account. Again, we're seeing how things like poverty and race play into disproportionate exposure to these environmental hazards. So lead poisoning is a big problem in our community. And the third environmental injustice that I want to talk about um, is the pollution of Placer Creek. Warren talked about how Placer Creek uh, is the tributary running through our neighborhood. We are in the Placer Creek watershed, which means the water that falls in our community, most of it flows to Placer Creek, which then flows out into the Grand River. And Placer Creek and the Placer Creek watershed, which is the land around the creek, the tributary, is actually one of the most polluted watersheds in Michigan. There's a quote here from Wendell Berry, who's uh, an agrarian, an essayist, and, and a poet um, that I love. Uh, and, and he, he kind of captures the ethic of watershed living, watershed neighborliness, or even watershed discipleship. Uh, when he says, do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. Do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. It's a play on the golden rule, right? Do unto those, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Um, but I think it really captures the interconnectedness of all of us living in a particular place, how we are all dependent upon the same resources for life, and how our actions are inextricably bound up with everyone else. Um, and I think a watershed exposes that reality maybe like nothing else does. So I want to show you a, a map. This map is really busy, so before you get overwhelmed, I just want to draw your attention to three pieces of this map. The first is the green and red borders uh, drawn in the top left. Those are the borders of Garfield Park and Alger Heights, respectively, rough borders. Next, I want to draw your attention to the middle bottom half of the map where you'll see a lot of orange diamonds, a lot of black squares, a lot of red dots, and a lot of green pins. So these are all sites, facilities that are releasing air pollutants, facilities that are releasing water pollutants, facilities that are releasing nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, and brownfield and superfund sites, which are really, really heavily polluted land. 
And then the third thing I want to draw your attention to are the circles. Many of them are up in the top left. Some of them are spread out elsewhere, but there's a collection of them in the top left. Many of them superimposed on our neighborhoods. And I want to talk about the connection, the relationship between these three things. So our neighborhood is up there in the top left. All of these polluting facilities, this polluted land is to the southeast of us. And then all of these health impacts that are being measured in cancer risk per million people and respiratory hazard risk, that's what those circles are, all of those health impacts that are being measured are to the northwest. And it's no accident that Placer Creek flows from the southeast of this map through those facilities down underneath Alger, or Alger Heights and then catches the bottom southwest corner of Gar Garfield Park and then flows northwest into the Grand River. It's the direction of the pollutants and the health impacts, right? I think this map shows really, really clearly how pollution upstream impacts people downstream and how it's impacting us as Garfield Park and Alger Heights residents and our neighbors. The pollution that's being released downstream is having direct impacts on those of us living downstream. Again, Wendell Berry says, do unto those downstream as you would have those upstream do unto you. So uh, three examples of environmental injustice here in our community, air pollution, lead poisoning, and the pollution on Placer Creek. So what can we do about it? What can we as neighbors do to respond to this reality? Well, just a few modest suggestions, hopefully as, as just a starting point. And then as I promised, um, I want to hand you off to folks that are doing this really important work so that hopefully you'll engage with them moving forward. So one of the first things you can do is, is become educated yourself. And then once educated, make some personal lifestyle changes, hopefully um, after tonight, you've learned a few things, and now you're ready to make some changes. Maybe you didn't know that Placer, Creek's, Placer Creek is as polluted as it is. Maybe you didn't know about all of the harmful health impacts that can result from pollution in a watershed. Uh, and so maybe you think twice about what you're sending down your own drain. Maybe you don't need to pour that bleach down the drain. Maybe that motor oil doesn't need to go in the storm drain at the curb. It never does, by the way. Don't ever do that. Uh, because it's all flowing somewhere, and most of it is getting into Plaster Creek. Uh, maybe you'll take Warren up and plant native landscaping. My wife and I ripped up about half of our backyard a couple years ago to put in native species. We love it. And I love that I know that when there's a heavy rain, at least that portion of my lawn is doing its part to capture that rainwater to percolate down through the water table so that once it finally reaches Placer Creek, it's doing it slowly, and the water that reaches it is cleaner than if it just runs off a hot black surface, carrying sediment with it, rushing into Placer Creek. Um, that's a really simple thing you can do uh, as well. Maybe you didn't know about how air pollution impacts our neighbors here in Garfield Park and Alger Heights. And so maybe the next time you need to get somewhere, maybe even down that US 131 corridor, you'll think twice. Maybe you'll ride your bike or take the bus or carpool if you're going to go with friends somewhere. Really simple stuff that we all know about, right? But maybe now you have one, two, or three more reasons to make that choice. Um, and I know in my own experience, it always helps to have people and stories in my mind to motivate me to make those choices. So now hopefully you have your neighbors in your mind when you think about whether or not to make those choices. Uh, you can also influence city policy. Policy is a really important way that we can create change in our community because uh, these realities are not accidental. They're the result of intentional policies. So other policies can lead to other outcomes. Uh, zoning laws, <laughs> uh, I admit, not very exciting, uh, but very, very important, right? Zoning laws determine which businesses go where, where polluting industries go, which communities live around those, those polluting industries, um, how we as a community can spread out uh, exposure to these health hazards rather than concentrating them. Uh, on um, BIPOC and poor communities. 
Uh, drain commissioner is another profoundly unsexy position, but really, really important. Um, here in Kent County, our drain commissioner is Ken Yonker. You may find his email with a simple Google search. Maybe you send him an email and ask, hey, what are you doing um, to address the pollution of Plaster Creek, and how can I help? What can I do about it? Uh, the Grand Rapids Office of Sustainability uh, is an office uh, in the city that is focused on sustainability in the city. You can also find their email address with a simple Google search. Maybe you send them an email and say, hey, what are you doing about the high levels of air pollution in my neighborhood, and how can I help? What can I do about it? And then uh, you can get involved with and support, including financially, local environmental justice organizations. So WEMIAC, the West Michigan Environmental Action Council, is doing good work on environmental justice in the community. Healthy Homes Coalition of West Michigan has been working for years and years to get lead out of homes in the community. They're doing really important work. Plaster Creek Stewards, as Warren mentioned, is working to clean up Plaster Creek. Uh, and they're doing it out of Calvin University from a distinctly Christian perspective saying, hey, we have a Christian responsibility to be good stewards of this resource. What does it say about us as people that um, Grand Rapids is one of the most reformed communities um, in the country, and its watershed is also one of the most polluted in the country? Um, we as reformed Christians, as I am, need to answer that question, and they're trying to. Uh, and finally, the community collaboration on climate change. We are lucky enough to be able to hear a presentation on that momentarily, so I will steal none of her thunder, and I look forward to it. Um, but, but that's it for me. I, I did not follow Warren's great example and include my email address, but Jen has it if you want to get in touch with me. Um, it's also just kyle at creationcare.org. Thanks. So it can feel really overwhelming with all that information. So is there a good resource that some of the statistics that you shared for people um, to, wear, to raise awareness? So where can they find some of that information that you shared? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the air pollution study was out of the University of Michigan, um, and it made headlines maybe about a year ago or so. Um, so if you, if you Google University of Michigan Environmental Justice Grand Rapids report, something like that, some combination of Grand Rapids, University of Michigan Environmental Justice, you should be able to find that report. Uh, they have a really accessible executive summary um, that's really useful, and you don't need um, to have a doctorate to uh, interpret it. Um, and then the, the map showing the pollution of Plaster Creek actually came from Plaster Creek Stewart's website. Um, they have a collaboration with uh, several departments at Calvin University that have mapped this data in really helpful ways. And you can, you can just Google Plaster Creek Stewards and navigate to those resources there. OK, thanks. Um, I'm also curious. It seems like, so, like I said, overwhelming. So as an individual, it can sometimes feel like you're not making a difference. So can you kind of speak to that? Absolutely. Um, the, the, in my, my work, I'm often confronted with a question, do we encourage people to make personal changes or do we empower them to advocate for systemic policy change? And my answer is always yes. We have to do both. Um, we need people to be advocating for policy change because that's how we're going to uh, achieve the, the big structural change. Um, but we need those advocates to be grounded in personal practices that can sustain their advocacy, because otherwise we burn out. Um, and the personal changes ground us because they are actually life-giving and joyful if we can find the right ones. Um, I, I get really frustrated with the way that a lot of people frame this um, as inherently sacrificial. Um, there, there are sacrifices we have to make, right? I, I will admit that. But we can find joy in that sacrifice. An example is my wife and I, several years ago, decided to eliminate as much meat as possible from our diet. Um, and that seemed really daunting at the time. But we took it slow. We did it meal by meal. Um, and we found alternatives. And before we knew it, we were cooking together more than ever before. We were discovering new recipes that were really, really fun to cook. We became better cooks because we had to learn how to cook more things. And soon, we took a lot more joy in our food than we ever did before. 
Um, so I am convinced that we can actually find joy and more life when we make these choices. They don't have to be um, dour sacrifices that cost us. Uh, we can get a lot from it, too. Thanks. That's yeah, helpful. Thanks. All right. So next up, we have Greg from Urban Roots, and he even brought some visual aids for us to uh, learn all about composting. introduction and invitation being here. Let me help to put this up. Again, my name is Greg Mankowski. I'm the compost manager at Urban Roots. Uh, I'll give you a little context or background about Urban Roots, and then we'll, we'll jump into with the composting topic. Um, urban Roots is a nonprofit urban farm and education center located right on Madison Ave, south of uh, Hall Street. Um, I encourage you to swing by, stroll through the garden, um, or otherwise participate via volunteerism, um, participating in, our, in your compost, our compost collection service, or in other means uh, or events that we attend. Just show some support. And uh, our, our mission is to cultivate healthy communities with the tagline of Grow, Eat, Learn. Since 2015, we've been proud to collaborate with our neighbors and community partners in cultivating a local food and education asset to the West Michigan community. We host program experiences that focus on connecting people of all ages and backgrounds to the soil and the table. And I think composting um, really transcends everybody from every background. It's interesting to, to young people all the way up to seniors in the community. Um, because of different experience levels and just the neat factors that you find in the compost pile like worms, which appeals to most kids. So I'd like to start with this quote. This is from a book uh, that's it's, it's, it's called Let It Rot by Stu Campbell. It's, uh, it's not too text dense, so it's, it's a nice one to read. But anyway, here we go. Composting is a way of using up what we have in abundance. Humble things like weeds and dead grass and garbage and old sticks to repay a long-standing debt to the earth. So in that photo there, um, that's uh, working with a small group pre-COVID. Notice the no masks there. but um, And demonstrating how to build a pile from the ground up. Um, I think why I chose this quote or why it resonates with me so strongly is that um, composting is really a means to see materials through a different lens and see them as valuable um, when they come from the earth. No organic material is waste. It's a resource for another living organism or for us humans in the sense of us controlling the composting process and yielding a finished compost product to use in, in your own garden space or as a as an opportunity to empower people in your community by creating jobs and creating a healthier space for people to live, whether it's just beautifying uh, the neighborhood by utilizing it for, for planting nat native plants um, and helping amend those, or by donating it to a community garden. Okay, so I got a quick, uh, got a quick test for you at home. <laughs> So think to yourself, do you know the difference between garbage and trash as a definition? And I'll assure you, I didn't. So I'm going to give you just a few seconds to think about it. All right. So I think we all have used those words interchangeably. But what I found to be interesting is that trash is de defined as discarded matter or refuse. And garbage is wasted or spoiled food and other refuse as from a kitchen or household. So to me, trash implies a more negative context of something that's useless, leftover, not a resource. Whereas garbage, we need to shift the paradigm as a community and really as a, as a nation and value our food waste 
that isn't really waste, our food that went bad, that really is, is a resource out of place. Now, here's a quick definition for composting. The aerobic biological reduction of organic materials into a stable, nutrient-rich, finished compost product. I want us to focus on the word aerobic. Aerobic implies that the microorganisms doing all the, the, the bulk of the work here are, breathe oxygen. They need oxygen, just like us. Biological reduction, anything that was once alive, um, from plants, animals, um, and the other products that we, we use to, or we use those to convert into something else, are all considered a resource. And finally, materials into a stable, nutrient-rich, finished compost product. So at the end of the day, it, we're, we're providing an environmental benefit, a social benefit, and perhaps even a financial benefit for enterprises that utilize um, compost operations. Oh, I'm going to go back one. OK, so we're going to talk about the constituents of a compost pile on the left there. It's four simple things. Carbon, which is also known as a brown material. Nitrogen, known as a green material. Water content, and oxygen. What that all boils down to is all of those constituents are necessary for us to thrive, humans to thrive, other living animals to thrive. I want to tie this back into composting as a community. And maybe we can't see the individual organisms, but they very much react and um, collaborate like we do in our own society. So the finished compost on the right are the facts. It, it delivers stable nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as other micronutrients. It adds organic matter to the soil, increases moisture retention, improves aeration, controls erosion, builds soil structure, and as well, and maybe most importantly, attracts beneficial soil organisms, as well as other small critters and, and other animals. OK, how do I know what to throw, right? <laughs> It's a bit overwhelming. It, it really is. So I just want to break it down kind of kind of simply. And, it's, um, and then we'll go into a little more height, a little more depth of some of those individual materials. But on the left-hand side, your green materials or nitrogen materials, hence high in nitrogen, this is a way to identify it. They're typically fresh, green, edible, juicy, protein. It helps the, multi the microbes multiply quickly. While on the right, you have your brown materials or your carbon. Um, we, we give the color assignment to them just as a, a, a general base, but in reality, they can range in colors too. So, but generally, carbon materials are dry, brown, dead, brittle, and it's another source of energy for the microbes. And one thing I want to point out up here in the middle of the screen at the bottom is the coffee scoop. So um, yes, it, it's, it is a brown material in, in, you know, cosmetically, but it is a nitrogenous material or one that is in the green category um, and is one that most, I would say, is probably the most popular thing I see in the compost buckets is coffee grounds. OK, so this is by no means a comprehensive list. I just hand selected a few um, with maybe a few that you weren't quite as aware of. <laughs> um, so what's compostable? On the left hand side, that would be in the green category, your nitrogen source, your kitchen scraps like food waste. And I put in parentheses no animal products because here in the city of Grand Rapids, um, it's, it's, you sh I would not encourage you to to add those materials to your, to your home pile. However, they are technically compostable on an industrial scale. Coffee grounds, fresh grass clippings, other garden residues, and farm animal res manure, which isn't as uh, applicable to us in the city, but I thought it, 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 it definitely plays a role, especially on the farm side of things. And I, would, I wouldn't encourage you to add pet waste to your pile. Um, 
that wouldn't fall into that category. On the right, those are some examples of your carbon. Fallen leaves, hay, straw, wood chips, shredded newspaper, soil, um, stable bedding, if, again, if you're on a farm, pizza boxes with, with some grease on it. Now, some of these are not as, as, they're not necessarily a food source or just a natural thing, but I want people to start thinking a little outside the box when you consider how to source separate your materials and knowing and gaining confidence to know what you throw. I mean, honestly, when you start composting, you notice you really start paying attention to what you actually throw away in your trash, like going to the landfill and what you're recycling, perhaps. Um, and you notice that landfill-bound trash bin gets much, much smaller when you start turning up the dial on recycling and composting. Um, so in the, great, in the greater scheme of things, we need to create this awareness and education pattern for us as adults and, and our, the next generation. So it's easier of a transition when we embrace composting or organics diversion as a municipality or, or, or a state, rather, and a nation, that um, we're up to speed more and we can get more education on a, on a school level. All right. So compost provides many things for us. At the top of the list is insight into our food choices and diet, as well as our consumptive habits. Now, frankly, we're all guilty at buying more than what we can eat sometimes. It happens. And the greatest solution for that is just to simply compost it. But maybe you can amend your purchasing habits a little bit and consider, why did I buy this? Or next time I'll finish it on time or some other means to divert it without it going bad. Next, compost provides us nutrients and organic matter for growing, which is becoming ever more uh, increasingly important, especially in large-scale agriculture. As soils become more depleted of nutrients and lack soil life, we need to amend our soils. Um, and as well as due to development, um, urban development, we need to amend our soils with that organic matter and, and microorganisms. The high quality, soil, or high quality soil amendment product that is compost. So if, if the environment isn't um, the highest value point for some people, well then the financial point can speak to them. To me, composting provides financial, I will add, start with environmental, social, and financial benefits simultaneously across the board. Composting is a solution to organic waste management. It's a sustainable solution. And the easiest, lowest impact way you can play a role in that is just simply doing it at home. Compost per stimulates a local circular economy. So essentially, you're keeping that wealth within the community. If you go to the farmer's market or even your local grocer, that you buy Michigan produce in season and you, you're supporting that farmer or store and let's say some of that food doesn't go, it goes bad quickly. Well, you can A, send it to the landfill where those nutrients are lost forever, trapped in the landfill, a linear model, or turn it into a more cyclical system that can translate those nutrients into a different form and then yield more benefits down the line and not impact the community um, with the negative externalities or legacy that a landfill um, provides, unfortunately, to, to areas, the surrounding communities um, around it. And compost is very versatile. It's, there's a multitude of applications from small scale, you know, in your backyard garden, just growing juicy vegetables to your, your local urban garden or um, rain garden, perhaps, in the neighborhood, um, as well as municipal projects from, from uh, parks to other beautification efforts. Okay, I'm going to go through this pretty quick just because the numbers are kind of hard to wrap your head around as context, but these numbers are from a waste characterization report done by the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum in 2016. Um, so the 1.7 million cubic yards of per year in 16 
was the entire volume of what went to the landfill. So that includes everything, you know, not just organic materials. We're not just talking food waste right now. But 12.6% of that by weight was food waste. And if you look in the left bottom corner, it's a little bit hard to see, but it says 35% organics in that, um, that little pie, pie chart there, wheel graph. So what that signals to me is that we have this immense opportunity to continue to um, continue to proliferate this organic management, organic material management strategy to many more people in the community. And we have a lot of work to go to get to reimagine trash campaigns, 90% reduction of landfill bound waste by 2030. And that affects all of us, not just um, people who live and work in the Madison community or the 49507 zip code, but everybody who lives in the community of Kent County. So throughout the year, well, COVID permitting, share your leftovers, <laughs> um, especially at holiday things. Um, you know, we always it's, it's, it's have spend a joyful time chatting, sitting at the table, eating together, you know, um, share that food with the with whoever you can um, and have composting as a home composting is the best next solution if you can't um, share that food with others. Another alternative throughout the year is if you're not as interested in setting up a compost bin outside, well, or let's say you don't have the space if you're an apartment dweller, um, there are other options out there, one of which is a worm bin. Um, it's really fun. I, I, I started one in January, and I've I've watched the little <laughs> the the little guys grow into a, a bigger community, and uh, it also does yield um, um, worm tea, which is which is a it is how it sounds. But <laughs> so you apply it to your plants and um, worm castings, which are also excellent as a soil amendment for your plants. So that's just another fun way um, alternative to composting, but they're closely related. Residential compost pickup programs you can participate. Um, in your community by supporting them, um, the community scale composters, or finding the program that suits your needs, um, if it's a commercial scale, perhaps. And lastly is purchasing as much as you can locally. Um, your food as much as you can, as well as um, if you do want to buy compost um, for your yard or garden, Buy, look up local composters or compost producers and see if they can make a delivery to you or where you can go and um, purchase some. So it begins and ends with compost. Before the 20th century, for, for eons, as far as organized agriculture was concerned, I suppose, um, humans have known the value of using manure and other natural soil amendments to increase y crop yields. This is a, um, it's just a, a well-known fact in the, the history of, of mankind or humankind. And post-World War II with the invention and mass production um, leading to a dependence on synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, to increase monoculture crop yields, which is a single crop in a field, which perhaps isn't even grown for human consumption. And those, those um, persistent uh, chemicals trickle downstream and make people, um, reach people in communities that are not even close to where the source uh, of the, the source or use of those particular substances were, were. And if we can mitigate that by promoting composting again at scale, well then we are impacting not just ourselves, but the future generations to come. So let's start composting. At the beginning I said, you can start tomorrow. It's, it's, it's really that easy. You can start by just simply collecting your materials in a bucket or a Tupperware or a coffee can and then next, going to your backyard, finding a location that's convenient for you. As with everything, it needs to be a little bit convenient. Otherwise, you're going to not get into that habit right away. 
Um, I want to, I guess I'll point out this book because I forgot to show it a little earlier. But as a reference point, um, you might be able to see it, but it's, <laughs> I'm just plugging the Rodale Book of Composting. It's one that's readily available at almost every library. Um, it's a really good guide for all gardeners and folks who are environmentally conscious. Um, and I encourage you to, to leaf through that, find what information is helpful for you at home um, as a guide. And, as, and uh, again, I mentioned Let It Rot is another form of, uh, I guess, a resource that is a little bit thinner, a little slimmer to read. Um, but again, we'll will help you re-envision the way you see your garden and the materials that you produce at home every day. Um, it's Composting is a, it shouldn't take much effort to do. It's, all the materials are literally at arm's reach sometimes. And they're things that we don't uh, particularly um, see as value, like in the spring or fall, collecting those leaves, you know, that's a chore. Well. Don't make it a chore. Make it uh, a proactive, proactive task for the next growing season. Just pile all those leaves in the corner. You don't need to bag them. Just, just leave them there and start feeding them into your pile. So, oh, <laughs> one other thing on that. So, one thing I want to talk about is just be an ambassador in your community. Talk about it with your neighbors. Maybe build a compost pile that you share with your, your, your neighbor across the way. Um, composting is a sustainable habit and a healthy activity. It requires only a little bit of work, and it really just depends on your diligence level. Um, composting provides physical and emotional benefits to everybody. Um, whether you're, you're enjoying that, that fruit or vegetable you grew with the, the finished compost, or you're simply turning the pile and just getting a little bit of exercise. Teach others the value of compost. Maybe it's just showing them a couple worms, you know. Um, but it, it's intriguing, I think, at every level. And honestly, is um, you can find so many lessons about life in, and um, really interest from every age group. Lastly, produce your compost and boost your garden. Like I said, start tomorrow if you can. So start thinking about it. What, how do I start separating these? And um, create a plan for yourself. And I'll say this, composting, it can seem overwhelming to start, for sure. Um, but know that it's, it's a forgiving process. It's, it's natural. And whatever you do, it's not going to, um, in, in a general sense, you're, you're going to have the finished compost. It might just take a little longer than what you're expecting. Let's see. So last, I want to plug uh, the Department of Public Works. They have a nice page that reviews composting and gives some tips and pointers for us in our community. And at the top right of the screen also, if you're interested to learn more about the master plan for Kent County, uh, do some research. Go to reimaginetrash.org and learn more about how to make an impact that way. And there's some references. And you can reach me. My email's up there, greg at urbanrootsgr.org. OK, we had a viewer question. Um, she owns a dog and a rabbit. Can she compost their waste? OK, that's a good question. So the rabbit, you, you may. Rabbit is like excellent manure, along with the bedding and the hay and straw, to just throw into your pile. You could even top dress it on your garden as a mulch in some circumstances. Now your dog manure, um, unless you're, I, I would not consider that to be something you want to throw into your pile at home. Okay, thanks. Um, you mentioned wood chips. I was curious if that included the wood chips that are dyed. We see a lot of red wood chips in, you know, around the oh. city. So I'm curious if you mean yeah. the natural undyed wood chips. So. That's a great question, and I would have to do a little bit of follow-up to like really specifically hone in. But I, you know, I would believe that if as long as they're they're uh, stained with some natural, um, you know, coloring, that it would be fine. But I would encourage you to get the raw wood chips that are just a freshly ground tree. Um, a lot of uh, tree 
tree um, companies, removal companies, if you call them in advance, you know, sometimes they'll, they'll just come to your house and drop off the, the, the wood chips from the day's job. Um, so I would encourage you to check some of those folks out because, hey, everybody loves that. Yeah, that's a great tip. Thank you. Um, and are there any local sources for, let's say, if you wanted to do like the tumbler type compost bin versus something that's on the ground? Are there, rather than going to Amazon? Right. Right? <laughs> um, there, there's a few, yeah. Uh, you know, as far as specific brands, I'm kind of, it's escaping me, but the, I would encourage you, so you can go and seek out them, those specific brands, order directly from them. Yeah, bypass the middle, the middle distributor. Or, you know, there are some really easy DIY bins out there on, on, um, on maybe Pinterest or other things like that, that is, uh, you know, a fun project you could whip out in an afternoon, and it would essentially, you know, be the same, same, uh, same uh, material. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Greg. All right. And lastly, um, we have Sarah to come up and talk about C4. So uh, I wanted to, uh, before we start the presentation on C4 and what uh, my role is, I wanted to just talk about the community advocacy for just a second and really talk about the information that was exchanged here today. I'm just very enlightened to talk about all of the quadrants that we talk about for sustainability for future generations. Um, and how that looks like and what we can do our parts in. And not only that, but the health and the capacity that we can actually take an active effort into doing these types of uh, motions and these mechanisms that we created, that we channel through. The first thing that I want to acknowledge is I want to acknowledge our water. I want to acknowledge our Nabi. I want to acknowledge those creations, um, our winged, our swimmers, our four-legged, and our two legged spirits as, as we consider ourselves humans. And that sustainability would not be approachable if we did not care for the one thing that is vital to all of our creation, and that is the character of our water and um, how that's fluid in all communities, how that impacts all of our communities. Um, so with that, I'll get started in kind of the um, C4 that we have. So community collaboration on climate change is what the C4 is referenced to. Um, going over the presentation, we have a little bit of the background on how C4 um, has transitioned into um, the community collaboration that it's involved in, the vision, and of course, you know, what do we do? What is, what is our role? Um, what is the advocacy um, that we're going to play a part with the city and our communities? Um, the infrastructure and plan, you know, what are our values? What are the next steps that we plan to embark on to create of, um, a new innovative idea around sustainability with climate change? And then our process, the importance and lessons learned of the cultivating that relationship um, that we have. So starting with the background, um, the C4 planning team honors and really understands the, so the social circumstances that require remote engagement practices at the same time that many of the um, committee members were and still actively engaged in, um, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement highlighting police brutality, racism in this country. Climate change is both immediate and hidden threat in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And through previous presenters, they kind of touched on all of those realms that impact um, climate change and you know the deficits that our communities face. And so it causes integrated with extraction systems and policies based in capitalism and white supremacist culture, which are intertwined with the complex solutions of racial equity. 
And I wanted to touch that environmental justice is not just a native issue. It's an everybody issue. It's an all race issue. It's an all communities issue in climate change and that struggle for our sustainability and our purpose. And so we created this and we, we created C4 in the beginning before COVID hit. And so now some of the things that we face are black indigenous and people of color that are more disappropriate, negatively impacted by climate change, we know that. We shared some stats on that information today. Um, the other thing is that our, you know, our communities are severely underrepresented. You know, um, we're often an afterthought when it comes to the complexities of how it affects our communities, our youth, our elders, our water systems. And so we got together as community leaders and talked about the impacts and what Grand Rapids is lacking, which is a solid and stable infrastructure and addressing the challenge and the systemic barriers that we're facing. And to really have a voice to try to make that policy change, to really try to make those active efforts in our community and city at large, and getting those other um, communities involved in what we're doing. Um, climate change is both urgent and long-term. I talked about water very briefly. If we don't take care of our water plants, our native plants, our medicines, our gardens, our um, farms that nourish us will cease to exist if we don't look at the impact. Lack of awareness and understanding surrounding the diversity, equity, inclusion, and climate justice. And so we talked about the city department that addresses that. And so they're actively involved in providing the solutions that we have that we've come together come together. So we provide resources direct, directly to activists of color. So the C4 committee, and we'll show um, later on in the slide that it's made up of a large part of community individuals. We're civic leaders. We're people that talk about the injustices that are going on and we're taking our organizations to the forefront to represent those voices. We're redefining what that system looks like. We're talking about the challenged conversations. We're talking about the lack of resources. We're developing a stronger network of organizations and committee talent, community talent, to address those, to address those experts in the fields of who we represent. We're addressing the urgent and systemic barriers that we're currently facing. And we're doing that simultaneously with the work that we're doing in community. Understanding of our people, because we know of people of color, we face different deficits in our community. One of the things is sometimes how am I going to think of how do I afford to feed my family and you want me to be concerned about climate change? We address that. We talk about those challenged conversations on how it affects those generations and how it affects our families and why is it important? Why do we do the work that we do? And so our vision statement, <clears throat> black, indigenous, and people of color and historically white environmental organizations will dismantle extractive systems and build new systems to address climate change centered in human well-being and interconnectedness of life and access to shared leadership. All of my colleagues that were here tonight, that statement really engulfed all of those, you know, those things that were uh, spoken of before me, trying to have that interconnectedness. How, how do we become involved into that? And so we took that voice and we made that vision statement. We created a vessel, and that was our vessel that we're going to carry into our communities. So why build something new? The Community Sustainability Partnership was originally, the CS4 was originally designed under the CSP, which is a different form under the city of Grand Rapids that started to address the inclusion and inequities of environmental change. And this just gives a very quick background of what they started and where we picked up off in 2019. 
And so although we are all negatively impacted by climate change, black, indigenous, and people of color are dispos disproportionately impacted and aren't genuinely represented in the current environment and climate change environment or movement. In addition, organizations and individuals that have been most active in the climate space are not connected in that way that will result in time-sensitive, community-wide improvements, which is why I really talk about having those community activists involved because there's a disconnect of those environmental organizations and having a common language within our communities, making it resourceful, making it uh, accessible, and having our voice included, having representation is so important especially in these times. So the C4 planning team. Since August 2019, a group of city staff, community leaders, issue experts, and environmental active um, advocates have been meeting um, to redefine what CSP was and to create a new version, which is now the C4 committee. So we wanted to establish a new infrastructure, a new governance of how we would take these community needs regarding climate change and environmental justice and provide a new platform. And so we created uh, initial infrastructure for community partnerships, including youth, organization collaboration, and the creation of climate, climate justice movement. So the facilitation support with facilitation through the Weggie Foundation, we were awarded a planning grant that we received in 2019. We since then hired a team organizer as facilitates to foster the continued relationships and to have an organized flow to continue what we've built and to create a more in-depth um, infrastructure as we continue to implement the three-year planning grant. So once again, who is involved? Um, we have quite a list, and this list has grown a little bit. So we have people from different environmental justices organizations, schools, community organizations, different community activists, and their organizations represented. And they all have a voice and an influence into the C4 planning. So what did we create? We created momentum and direction, trusted relationships, because we created relationships that had intention, that had good intentions to come foster from those. And so the C4 planning team created infrastructure needed to launch this three-year pilot. And when we look at climate change as, as our folks, as a community person, it can be pretty broad and it can be pretty scary to really hone in on what's important and to really trust information that's being facilitated or you know, um, processed to us. And so we sketched out uh, a three-year plan accompanied with a budget provided through the previous feedback from our community relations. And we are proposing a new equity-centered process that will generate new outcomes by focusing on equity-centered movement, building, developing leaders, growing collaborations, sharing resources, and interconnected process. And so really building up that community aspect on what those community needs are and addressing um, climate change, addressing environmental justice. So our infrastructure and plan. So the core values that we have then we have equitable leadership, individuals, the organization, and our hub. And so in the beginning, we kind of talked about what our values, and we'll get further into that right here. So protect people and the environment. Dismantle injustice. Challenge the status quo. Really looking at what environmental justice looks like. It's not just a, like I said, it's an all people thing. It's not just a white male thing or a white neighborhood thing. It's all of our, it's all of our things. Cultivate belonging, recreating an interdependence on what that structure looks like. Share leadership, 
honor and support agency, dismantle barriers to access, reflect community, honor community agreements. So we talked about a lot of things earlier today about composting and about um, native plants and things like that, but there's still access. How do we recreate community garden? How do we create that healthy, what, what wealth looks like in our communities? And wealth is health to us. So community agreements that we had worked on. So be authentic. Speak your truth without blame or judgment. We talk about a lot of uncomfortable things, but it needs to be talked about in a healing way. Listen attentively with your ears, eyes, and hearts. Notice movements of discomfort or curiosity. Be open to experience and to teach each other, to listen to each other. Why am I speaking? Speak first to understand, then to be understood. Assume positive intent. Be open to all communication styles. Just like all of our environment, they all come in different species. They all come in different types of, we communicate with our plants differently. We need to be open to that. Think about the impact of your words beyond intent. Your words carry weight. It's okay if you're tired. Climate justice work is long term. We're young leaders in this. We need to acknowledge the folks that started this work before us, that have maybe left us, left those pieces for us to pick back up. We acknowledge that work. We acknowledge the continued work. This young man who mentioned the generations, we often think of eight generations of what's going to be left. And center equity, what does that look like to you? Reflect on what your role is going to be on that. So individual developing leaders, this is, this is the fun part. Unlock resources. We all represent different communities and we all have leaders that speak up on different types of expertise. Moving those individuals to talk about that, to talk about their ideas. What will get done? Continuously developing leadership within the community that will provide opportunity for self-determination, small-scale cam small campaigns, and increasing the amount trained in climate justice activists around Grand Rapids. How will it get done? We hire cohorts, six to 12 people, every six to 12 months in rotation, neighborhoods of focus to receive training and to organize a neighborhood campaign with option to continue with this work. A lot of times people of color are not open to opportunities like this to be able to excel in their communities represented. That's part of the change that we have is to provide that platform, that foundation for those young leaders to provide those passions and opportunities of what we want to change, what we want to commit to. So with the organization, participating organizations offer deep institutional and subject knowledge. Already engage stakeholders and establish networks. So organizations involved that we have offering that knowledge exchange, offering what a community garden, what that wellness does, what growing a three sisters garden looks like. Understanding those little community actions of identifying plant species and the opportunities. Someone mentioned some milkweed earlier and it just ran through me about making some milkweed soup that we make. Sharing that, sharing that, that ready available opportunity of knowing when to harvest that plant for sustainability, for a healthy meal, for those types of benefits. That's just one level of the type of knowledge from all of those organizations that you've seen could impact. What will get done? 
prioritization of issues, deep listening, identification of gaps in the work. We know this, working in systems work. You know, creating our, you know, defining what systemic change can look like. Bringing those voices, goal setting, how will it get done? Regular gatherings, commitment to those values, commitment to change, commitment to community, commitment to the people, commitment to the water. Continuing to see and engage and act process in the programming. And once again, commitment to transparency. What we have to offer the community and what that looks like, who's involved. So the C4 Hub, creating and sharing resources. Individuals and organizations offer their lived experience, subject matter, expertise, and access in their networks, creating a specific material and campaign per community. Each community should almost look different. How we utilize that in other systems has been success. How can we use that same platform to adjust our environmental justice system. How do we get those things involved and engaged at that level to raise that consciousness? And so creating this hub and this resource sharing is creating those successes, sharing those stories of that. Online resources, design materials, in-person meetings, training, resource sharing, Stuff that generates learning and networking, thinking and breaking down those traditional structures. The project manager will be directed and working with those folks appointed to steering committees and different levels of the implementation of what this would look like. So here's our proposed three-year plan. Hire a project manager, create our leadership map, Hire ambassadors, recruit and retain collaboration partners, map resources, and create a communication strategy. Develop a website of what our activism looks like. Support cohorts and campaigns and mini grants to continue our work. Launch a grant support platform. Create the storytelling collection lead engagement for development of a community-based climate action and adaption plan, which is new. Normally those folks in city offices are the ones that control that, right? So we're creating a switch, a paradigm in what that voice and what that power can look like because we often know it gets lost, right, at some level. Co-create a community climate action plan Create long-term sustainability plan for the C4. And this might change, right? As we create goals and launch goals and meet, it should change. It shouldn't just stay one solid plan. It should, it should change. It should have fluid. Evaluation. Provide program including interactive, sorry, interactive campaign and needs for potential redevelopment. So what wasn't working? What didn't we, what weren't we able to fulfill? What weren't we able to succeed in? And how do we need to look at that? What challenges did we have? So this is just a, a very quick overview of how we're spending down that budget. How we're allocating those funds to employment, project managers, community ambassadors, leadership stipends, specific events that we're gonna be hosting in our communities, equity and climate change, training for individuals, representatives from those communities that we want to put in the forefront and always worried about training dollars. We will take care of you. So mini grants for local community campaigns. And then of course we have to have a little bit of administration, right? So our promise, the C4 planning team took the time to build trust and solid relationships. This project has the potential to affect the entire Grand Rapids community 
by serving as a facilitator and a mediator of partnerships, of education, of consensus building, as well as creating a space for the robust climate change movement in our community. With proper support and community involvement, C4 will provide spaces for partners and residents to engage, resolve conflicts, build strategies, share resources, align vision, and most importantly, shift the focus of environmental work to be more equitable. In addition, an ongoing challenge and opportunity at the City of Grand Rapids is how to effectively, respectfully, and wholly engage community members into city planning process, strategy making, and program development. The C4 planning team offers a piloted example of community stakeholder engagement that centers representation, equal opportunity, decision making, and relational trust building for the committee members throughout the planning and training process. So from start to finish, when you looked over the quick budget, we want to engage those folks that want to strive for commitment to climate change, that want the opportunity to fight for environmental justice, but need that foundation because we know the system barriers that they face. So our process. Um, so this is a quick quote from um, Gail. And I like Gail, I've, I've presented with Gail before. Design done well is fully integrated process that practices community co-creation methodologies. The community collaboration on climate change has been working to build trust and bridge neighborhoods to redesign our systems and connect our community so that together we will define and meet our goals for climate equity and action. That's a big commitment. So equity leadership, how we strive to lead. Hero to the host. Shared leadership, shared leadership is built from a process that plans to host the new leaders, providing the resources and access necessary for new leaders to grow. We have identified actions that can be taken to cultivate this process moving from historically hero mentality to host mentality. So once again, instead of providing these communities with all of these deficits, which we know happens, how do we turn those into strengths? How do we create those conversations starting from a strength-based strength conversation versus a deficit? So we provide equitable conditions provide time, insist on learning, offer support, reduce bureaucracy, reflect back, defend the team, make achievements visible, and value. So our process continues. We see, engage, and act how we perceive the world and practice self-awareness. Engage, how we show up and engage rationality, how we listen, build relationships, and create strong containers for complex work. How we design, decide, implement, learn, how we influence direction, brings focus to action, engage in safe to fail experiments. So we need to have a check and balance. We need to make sure the process might change. The plan is not etched in stone and will be revised as needed by the project manager, leadership team, ambassadors, and participants. While the infrastructure is formalized, including the values, community agreements, vision, and leadership team governing principles, the planning team intentionality built into space to provide agency, to those that will participate over the next three years. To authenticate, engage in people of color and white dominant grassroots environment organizations, participants need to be prepared and committed to involve over time in partnership and this will undoubtedly result in refinements to the plan and process. 
that once again, just looking at kind of shaking things up, but healthy. Creating those intentive spaces. So kind of what we're gathered here today, right? How can we be involved? How and when? The plan is to be designed to be inclusive of, com of companies, organizations, and individuals who are committed to achieving the C4's vision through the established values, community agreements, and leadership team governments. C4 leadership team community ambassador, C4 project manager, organizer, spokesperson, activist, participant, observer, Avenues for engagement include both individual and organizational. The C4 leadership team and project manager, project manager will be established and hired in the summer of this year, 2021, and will communicate tentatively timelines for individual and organization participation. And so we just recently developed that job description and what that organizational chart would look like coming under C4 and it's project planning. So lessons learned. Slow down to make sure the process is most equitable it can be. Often white domination culture is focused on identifying quick outcomes, meeting arbitrary identified deadlines. Focusing on the process may be difficult, but is the most important way to move forward in an equitable sense or equitable fashion. And I have a quick story on that one. We were talking about you know, C4, and I was talking to another colleague of mine. And I said, yeah, you know, we're doing some C4. We're moving. You know, we got you know, awarded for this grant. And we're going to be you know, um, implementing some stuff in, into the city. And the first thing that they said they made reference to was, what are we building? What, what structure is going to be created? And it just talks about the framing of what environmental justice looks like. It looks like a structure. And we're trying to recreate that process. Why does it have to be building something instead of letting it sustain its life in its own ecosystem? You know? Um, so that was a little story just about some of the conversations that we've encountered around what the C4 is and bringing it to our communities. <clears throat> Ensure the right people are at the table from beginning. In our second phase of C4 planning team, we were able to increase the representation of people of color voices. However, having already begun brainstorming in our first phase, our newer team members were left out of those conversations. So in the beginning, we did see that there were still not enough people represented. And if we're going to have transparency and we're going to put these values out there, we needed those voices at the table. We needed those representatives. And we stopped until we were able to come together as a community. We were able to engage as one. So those are how deep the values go for the C4 team. So prepare. Um, encourage and create space for uncomfortable conversations. The uncomfortable conversations during the C4 um, team's planning were always ones that were most needed to have, and they are. It's because those most difficult conversations that trust and relationships grew within our team. Identify and share structural and institutional barriers with stakeholders. This has come up mostly in our fundraising efforts. As we were working with community-based organizations, sometimes the funder process is inaccessible. So identifying those barriers and communicate with the foundations and stakeholders. Be transparent. During our second phase of the C4 planning, some members had lower participation, and most of the members were um, communities of color. Why they were ex um, extenuating circumstances during the COVID, um, likely to contribute to you know, that type of outcome. 
As we saw job displacement from the least few of the members that were on our team. So some of those members that were actively involved, they got shifted to a new organization or a new job role. When sorting into our process that did not provide such a safe and accessible and inspiring space um, for participants of color to engage. Being more transparent with this issue moving forward is something we hope to work on towards as we see a setback. So if we go up and down into our state safety, just making sure that those individual, individual voices don't get lost. Acknowledge the complexity of the problem and process and develop multiple methods for communicating um, or addressing them. Our C4 journey is rich and complex. We need to streamline how and when, where, with whom we explain this journey. Our team members have been on this journey for the last year and half experienced the important nuances. Helping others understand our journey, process, and outcome come alongside with the journey, which is critical. Like we said, it, the C4 has transitioned from the original capacity of CSP into this new vessel. And so it's new. People want to know what we're doing, what we're planning, what we've been doing for the past year, and picking up those pieces and really engaging in the community at that at-large level. Um, yeah, so at this time, I know that you know environmental justice topic can be very big, it can be very broad, um, but there are community organizations, there are community um, involvement at every level. We've heard a lot of them here today, starting from you know our homes, you know creating a green lifestyle, um, building gardens, getting active in identifying plants, and and having all those, and at this largest level, which is a call to action getting involved with those community organizations that have those same values and can impact. Um, so once again, uh, thank you for your time. I know we have questions. Okay. Sorry, thank it's been a minute since we've been in, in community here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Um, so you don't have a website currently, correct? No, we're, Auntie's House is a new organization. Um, that I represent, and so we focus on community wellness and indigenous um, um, gardening foods. Okay. So we have a wellness program where we focus on providing that opportunity to our community, building um, plants and growing and um, harnessing, uh, harvesting our own food. Awesome. Well, you can share that information with me, and I'll pass it along sure. with our post-event um, information. So how can neighbors support the work of C4? You mentioned the cohorts, which are upcoming, correct? Um, as far as getting involved, I would have to say to follow us and to follow those organizations that were kind of listed earlier. And they'd be able to um, point to the lead person to that, especially, like I said, we're, we're developing those roles to kind of recruit, right? We're, we're looking to have um, that opportunity to really engage back in community and to see who we can recruit for, for, that, for that movement. Okay, so yeah, you can share those avenues to get in touch, please. Um, and then what's the most common question that you get when you mention that you're part of C4? Um, this one's kind of a, a little bit personal question just coming from an indigenous perspective. And that's often, um, when did you get involved? Or um, what's your role? Or what information? Um, and so it's, um, that's one of the most common questions as, as an indigenous person and caring for, you know, these roles. Um, so I guess that would be the most common thing and just giving them, just being transparent, you know, that, you know, this is who we are and, you know, we're peoples that were delivered those original instructions and, you know, we have that knowledge and we're not keeping that, but we want other people to have the Minobawatsawin, which is living a good life, you know, um, living in brotherhood of one another, you know, for this earth. So I think that's the best thing I can say to that. Oh, thank you. I feel like C4 does, you know, kind of espouses those values, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it.
All right, well, that wraps up our evening. I appreciate you um, sticking with us for this event and it will be available and recorded. I will share um, everything that we talked about tonight via email and on Facebook, the event page. Thank you so much.